In this video, we're going to talk about something called crystal field theory. So you might be wondering, what is crystal field theory? It's an attempt to explain the colors of transition metal complexes as well as their magnetic properties. So let's say if we have the cobalt 3 plus ion and we're going to react it with ammonia. And so it's going to form this octahedral complex ion. The reason why it's octahedral is because the cobalt is attached to six ammonia molecules. And that shouldn't be a 2 plus, that should be a 3 plus. So let me go ahead and fix that. Now ammonia in this chemical reaction is known as something called a ligand. It's attached to the transition metal ion cobalt 3 plus. And what happens is that the energy of the d orbitals in the cobalt ion, it changes as a result of this interaction with the ligand. So let me give you a visual illustration. So let's say this is the 3D orbitals of the free cobalt 3 plus ion. So these are degenerate orbitals. And the reason why they're degenerate is because they have the same energy. And so at, they're at the same level. Now, when the ammonia molecules approach the d orbitals, there's going to be electron-electron repulsion. And so the energy of the d orbitals will increase. Now, this right here is a hypothetical spherical crystal field. It represents the energies if the entire cobalt ion was completely surrounded from all angles with ammonia. So this is hypothetical. Now, in actuality, two of the five d orbitals will be higher than this hypothetical crystal field. And three of them will be lower than this hypothetical crystal field. But it's important to understand that these five, they're all higher than the original 3D orbitals that exist in the free metal ion. Now for the rest of this video, I'm going to talk about the energy levels of the new D orbitals with respect to those that are part of the hypothetical crystal field model. So let's say these are the 3D orbitals in the hypothetical crystal field. As we said before, two of them will increase in energy, and the other three will decrease in energy. The first two will go up by approximately three-fifths of the energy value. And the other two, I mean the other three, will go down by negative two-fifths relative to these values. Now delta sub-zero, or delta naught, it represents the crystal field split in energy for the octahedral case. So that's what the O stands for. Now you might be wondering, where do we get these numbers? 3 fifth and negative 2 fifth. Where does that come from? Well, to conserve energy, if we multiply 3 fifth by 2, because 2 of the d orbitals went up in energy, that will give us 6 over 5. And if we multiply negative 2 over 5 by 3, we're going to get the same thing just with the opposite sign. So these two numbers add up to zero. So what this means is that the two d orbitals that went up in energy is equal to the three d orbitals that went down in energy because energy cannot be created or destroyed. So the amount of energy that was used to bring up the two d orbitals on top is equal to the amount of energy that was used to bring down the three orbitals at the bottom. So now let's get rid of this. The next thing you need to know is that the 2D orbitals, I mean the two 3D orbitals at the top is associated with something called the EG set and the ones on the bottom is associated with the T2G set. Now the two 3D orbitals that went up in energy, they're known as the dx squared y squared orbital 
and the other one is the d z squared orbital. Now the three that went down in energy for the octahedral case, it's different for the tetrahedral case, which we'll talk about later. The three that went down, it's the dxy orbital, the dyz orbital, and also the dxz orbital. Now let's talk about why that's the case. So here is the cobalt 3 plus ion, and it's surrounded by six ammonia molecules. And it forms an octahedral molecular geometry. Now what we need to do is think of this system or think of these uh, ligands or ammonia molecules as negative point charges to understand why certain orbitals go up in energy and why others go down. So keep that in mind. Think of the ammonia molecules as negative point charges. So what we're going to do first is draw the 3D Z squared orbital. And so I'm going to draw four negative point charges one at the top and one at the bottom. Now my drawing is not perfect so hopefully you'll make the best of it. Now I'm gonna draw the D sub Z squared orbital in red. So it's along the Z axis. Let's do that again. And here's the other portion of it. And then it has something that it looks like this. So that's my rough sketch of the 3D Z squared orbital. So this is the Z axis. Here is the X axis and here is the Y axis in the 3D coordinate system. So as you can see, it's along the Z axis. Now, what you want to take from this is that notice that the 3D orbital is pointing directly on this negative charge and this one too. So it's directly on it and that is an unstable situation. And this is why the 3D Z squared orbital goes up in energy. It's because it's directly on a negative point charge. It's directly on that ammonia molecule. So make sure you understand that. Now the second one that I'm going to draw is the dx squared y squared suborbital. So let's begin by drawing the six negative point charges. Now for this one, the orbitals are also pointing directly on the negative charges. But notice that the orbitals are in the xy plane and not in a z plane. So you can think of this direction as being x and this direction here as being y. But going directly above the plane, that's the z direction. But it's not directly on the x-axis or on the y-axis, as you can see. So just to review, this is the x-axis here, and this is the y-axis. But what you want to take from this is that the orbitals, they're pointing directly on the negative point charges. And because of that, once again, we have an unstable situation. And so this is why the dx squared y squared orbital goes up in energy is because the orbitals are directly on those negative point charges. Now the other three are lower in energy than the first two d orbitals that we just drew because the orbitals are not directly on the negative point charges. So I'm going to draw one of the remaining three. So let's focus on the d sub xy orbital. We're going to draw this, the same type of 
molecule or geometry. And notice the difference. So the orbitals will still be in the xy plane. But this time, you have one orbital that is directly on the x-axis, and then the other portion is directly parallel to the y-axis. So this is the part that's parallel to the x-axis, and this is the part that's parallel to the y-axis in the xy plane. Now my drawing's not perfect, but the way it's shown, it's not really parallel to the z orbital because this is really z, this should be x, and this should be y. So I don't have a perfect 3D structure. But the reason why this particular 3D orbital is lower in energy than the other ones, as you can see, the 3D orbital, it doesn't point directly on a negative charge. As you can see, these two, they're between this negative charge. They're not directly on it. And that's why this particular orbital is lower than the dx squared y squared orbital and the dz squared orbital. Now let's focus on drawing the crystal field splitting diagram. We need to distinguish how to draw the weak field and the strong field splitting diagrams. So let's start with the weak field. In the weak field diagram, the split in energy will be very small. So here are the three d orbitals at the bottom, and here are the two at the top. So the split in energy is the difference between these two levels. And so we have a very small amount of energy here. Now, in the strong field case, the split in energy will be much larger. So here are the two at the bottom, and here is the two at the top. And so we have a much larger split in energy difference. Now, as we said before, the orbitals at the top is referred to EG, and the ones at the bottom, T2G. Now, let's say if we have a D6 system. So we have a transition metal with six d electrons. How do we fill up these orbitals with those six electrons? In the weak field case, you need to fill it up one at a time. You don't after the third one, you don't want to pair up the fourth one with the first one. Because the energy difference is so small, it's easy for the fourth one to go up. And the reason for that is the split in energy is a lot less than the energy that's needed to pair up the electrons. Because anytime you have two electrons sharing an orbital, there's going to be some electron-electron repulsion. And so you can refer it to as the parent energy. So because it's easier to put an electron on top in the weak field case, that's where it's going to go. The fifth one is going to go here. Now for the sixth one, we have no choice but to start pairing it up. So that's how you can put the electrons in the weak field case. You want to put them one at a time before pairing it. In the strong field case, after you fill the first three individually, then you need to pair it up. It's going to take a lot of energy to put the electron in this orbital because it's so much higher. And so in this case, the split in energy is a lot larger than the parent energy. So in the strong field case, you want to pair up the electrons at the lower energy levels before filling the ones at the higher energy levels. So we're going to place the six electrons like this. Now the next thing we need to do is write the electron configuration for each system. How can we write it for the first system? For the first system, in the T2G set, notice that we have a total of four electrons. 
So we're going to write T2G with a 4 superscript. And in the EG system, we have two electrons placed there. So this is how we can write the electron configuration for the weak field situation. Now what about for the strong field? All six electrons are in the T2G set. So we're going to write it as T subscript 2G superscript 6. And so that's how you can write the electron configuration for these systems. Here's the next question for you. Which of these two fields represents a paramagnetic situation and which one represents a diamagnetic system? On the left, we have the most number of unpaired electrons. We have a total of four unpaired electrons. Whenever you have a lot of unpaired electrons, the metal or the ion, in this case the transition metal complex that we're dealing with, is going to be considered paramagnetic. Now you might be wondering, what does that mean? What does it mean for a substance to be paramagnetic? A paramagnetic substance is one that is weakly attracted to an external magnetic field. Now what about the strong field case? Notice that there are no unpaired electrons. All the electrons are paired. So we have zero unpaired electrons. So this is known as a diamagnetic situation. So this substance with this particular strong field uh, diagram is diamagnetic. And that means that it's weakly repelled by an external magnetic field. Now the next topic that we need to discuss is we need to determine which of these systems is considered high spin and which one is considered low spin. What do you think? So looking at the system on the left, the weak field diagram, is it associated with a high spin system or a low spin system? So this, the weak field, is associated with a high spin system. And the reason for that is because it contains the maximum number of unpaired electrons. On the right, the strong field diagram is associated with a low spin situation because we have the minimum number of unpaired electrons. So that's another thing that you want to add to your notes. There's one more thing that I want to mention with what we have on the board. This right here is the crystal field split in energy. And the next thing we need to calculate is the crystal field stabilization energy. Now, I may have to, actually, let's go back. I'm going to delete what I have on the right side so I can calculate the crystal field stabilization energy on the left. So how do we go ahead and... Uh, I mean, how do we calculate this thing? What do we need to do? So recall that relative to the hypothetical crystal field diagram, which is, let's say, over here, the two orbitals at the top, they increased by positive three-fifths of the crystal field split in energy. And the three orbitals at the bottom, they decreased by negative two-fifths times delta sub naught. So how can we use that to calculate the crystal field stabilization energy? Well, let's focus on the electrons in the T2G set. There's four of them. And those electrons, they're in uh, d orbitals that went down by negative two-fifths of the crystal field split in energy. So we're going to multiply those four electrons by negative two-fifths times delta sub naught. Now the two electrons in the EG set, they went up by three-fifths of the crystal field split in energy. Now we also need to take into account, due to the fact that there's some energy that's needed to pair up two electrons. And so we're going to call it a parent energy. 
and we only have one of those. So here we have 4 times negative 2, which is negative 8. And here we have 2 times 3, which is 6. Negative 8 plus 6 is 2. So when you simplify the math, you should get negative 2 over 5, delta 0, plus 1 PE. So this is the crystal field stabilization energy relative to the hypothetical crystal field energy. That's how you can calculate it. Now, let's go back to the other one. I'm going to redraw it. So the strong field case, where we had six electrons in the T2G set. So the first two energy levels, they went up by positive 3 fifths times delta naught. And the three d orbitals at the bottom, they went down by negative 2 fifths. So using this, and based on a previous example, go ahead and calculate the crystal field stabilization energy relative to the hypothetical crystal field energy. So we have six electrons in the T2G set. And so we're going to multiply them by negative 2 over 5 times delta 0. And we have three sets of paired electrons. So this is going to be plus 3PE. And so 6 times negative 2, that's negative 12. So our answer is going to be negative 12 over 5, delta 0 plus 3PE. And so that's how you can calculate the crystal field stabilization energy.